One of our guests of the day, the other one today, is a man you may recognise, or maybe you don't. Jordan Peterson has achieved that rare feat, becoming a global superstar academic. So how did he become so well known? He first came to national prominence in Canada in 2016 in a debate about new laws on gender identity. Bill C-16 made it an offence to refuse to call someone by their chosen gender pronoun. Jordan Peterson argued that this would infringe free speech, while some supporters of the bill said he was advocating prejudice. From there, his YouTube star took off, and he has now over one million subscribers. And his videos, where he talks everything from identity politics, which we've touched on, to the Bible, to Disney movies, have been viewed over 150 million times. Gosh, that's about the same number of viewers we have on this program. Huh. Last year, he supported ex-Google employee James Damore, who had been fired for suggesting men and women have different interests due to biological differences. And his latest book... 12 Rules for Life has taken him on a global tour promoting his ideas and just this week he sold out the 1,000-seater Emmanuel Centre around the corner here in Westminster. Um, so Jordan, you've done endless interviews, you've been publicising yeah. your book and they've generated plenty of heated debate. And I actually sold out the Apollo, it had 5,000 seats. All right, stop boasting. <laughs> um, do you think though, because of the heat that has been generated, that your views have been misrepresented at times? Oh, definitely, but that's, you know, that's part and parcel of the process. I did take a very um, uh, forceful stance, let's say, against some of the excesses of the radical left-wingers, and it's in their best interest to paint me as uh, somehow a figure of the extreme right, because then I don't have to be contended with. But, I mean, it's easy for people's views to be oversimplified in a very large public debate. I mean, in terms of some of the issues, I mean, you say you've been uh, painted as, a, as a, an extreme right winger. No, or, some people or, have tried yeah. that. Not very successfully, but they've tried it. And you came to prominence um, in part over your opposition to this law that we just talked about yeah. in Canada, proposing the use of preferred pronouns for transgender people. Mm. Just for clarity. Mandating them. Yeah. Right. That Saying that you should issue. do it. No, but, that you had to do it. Uh, right, you had to do it by law. Right. But just for clarity, do you think a trans woman is a real woman? I don't really like the way those questions are formulated. You know, I don't know what that means. What do you mean a real woman? Well, she I'm asking you, in your mind, you know, it depends what you think a real woman is, but do you think a trans woman is a woman? No. Why not? Because I think that women are capable, generally speaking, of having babies, and they have female genitalia, and they have an XX chromosome, and, and I think the biological markers are relevant doesn't necessarily mean that I don't think that people should be treated with respect and dignity if they happen not to fit easily into a gender category. That's a different issue. Right. But, but it's a matter of definition. And, and I actually think it's a foolish argument in some sense. Because what do you mean by real? Well, I mean, you've just clarified that, though. You, you, you don't think um, that a trans woman is a woman. And do you, do you think that that is what is behind or explains your opposition to this idea of a law mandating you to use a no. preferred pronoun is because you don't actually believe that that's the truth, that a trans woman is a woman and therefore you can't use that pronoun? No, that's not my argument at really? all. Yeah, really. My yeah, argument is that the no, government I know what your shouldn't compel is. voluntary speech. No, but I know what your argument is. And no, but that's very really clearly. It. No, but, but behind, that's exactly it. There's the no motivation behind, behind it. There's no motivation it. behind it. But you don't believe it. I wouldn't put everything on my li online in my life to take the stance I did unless I had thought that through very deeply. And I've thought it through very deeply. There aren't hidden motivations that have to do with some arbitrary prejudice against trans people. Okay. It's purely, pure and simply this. There's never been a time in English common law history where the government compelled speech and the Canadian government dared to do that. And that was unacceptable. And they masked it with this show of, of compassion for the oppressed. And I don't buy it. Right. But you would, as I think you said, at an individual level, mm -hmm. if somebody Wouldn't asked have. you, if, you know, somebody asked you to use a particular pronoun, you would do mm -hmm. so. Well, I have. You have. Yes. Right. Fine. Yes. Let's talk about feminism. Are you a feminist? Uh, no, not as it's currently defined, certainly not. No, uh, well, in any other definition? Well, I think that anybody who doesn't think that the, the competitive landscape should be opened up for equality of opportunity is not thinking. And so everyone's interests are better served if people have as equal access to opportunity to display their talents and to manifest their talents in the world as possible. So in that sense, certainly. 
But feminism now, it's, as far and this is why it's so deeply unpopular, a very small minority of women in the UK identify as feminists. And the reason for that is it's primarily become an ideological weapon. And it's an ideology that I don't, I, I detest, actually, the ideology that it's associated with, collectivist ideology. Right. I mean, OK, and that's your view about feminism. Aisha, are you a feminist? Oh, absolutely. I'm a very proud uh, feminist. And when I was um, a special advisor in government, I worked on women and equality issues, and I'm very proud, actually, of a piece of legislation I got on the statute book with my former boss, Harriet Harman, the Equality Act uh, in 2010, which strengthened our anti-discrimination um, laws. And I fought very hard to get more women into public life, into the Labour Party, and, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm very, very proud of being a feminist, hence my pink dress. Oh, well, <laughs> all right. Um, obviously reverting to type, then, Absolutely, in the pink dress. Absolutely, well... Um, you would like men to regain or reclaim their strength physically, mentally and morally. Is that broadly correct? I would say morally, fundamentally, but I think the other things go along with that. Right. And, and if that but is... it isn't men precisely who I'm, who I'm speaking to. It's, it's people. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm actually interested in individuals and I'm interested in their fortification against tragedy. You know, every time I do an interview, the interview is always political. It's always mm. political. Well, the, cl the clue is in the title of this program. <laughs> we are the Daily Oh, Politics. no, no, fair enough. No, no, look, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. And I'm, I'm not casting aspersions <laughs> at this program, but the fundamental news that's important about what I'm doing isn't the political element. And the people who but talk what? to me don't talk politically. They well, say they've watched but, but my part, lectures. But part and of that it is, sorry, is mm. that I think for a lot of people, the kind of personal does become the, 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 the political. Or well, the political becomes the personal. Yeah, and I think in terms of the... Yeah, the, but the, in the, this I... situation, a lot of people are wrong because primarily what's happening is people are watching my lectures and as a consequence, their lives are improving dramatically. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they are. I'm sure people are like, have had a huge conversion after it's and they're much conversion. happier once they've been... It's not a conversion. Been. But it's, uh, what, it's what I would like to do is, is kind of almost... I think at the moment the discussion about feminism is very d d divisive and it, sometimes it can sort of be like, OK, men have to lose and women have to gain. Actually, mm -hmm. everybody has a lot to gain mm. by greater equality. Now, whether you get the equality of outcome that you want, I think only time will tell. But certainly, equality of opportunity is, is very important. And actually, well, we a, lot, and a lot of men would, would benefit from that. So I think a lot of men, men are having a lot of crises at the moment in terms of mental, mental health, mm. suicide issues, um, their own sense of identity, because I think some of the stereotypes put on men are quite limiting for them as well. I think they make men quite unhappy as well. The so, devil's in the details with regards to equality because I'm a, an advocate of equality of opportunity. But and I outcomes. Think the idea, outcomes. That's an appalling doctrine. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, because well, you have to produce an unbelievably potent bureauc bureaucracy to make the ever greater and ever finer distinctions that are necessary to enforce equality of outcome. How many group differences are you going to equalize across? Is it just gender and sex? How many genders? No, so gender and ethnicity? How many genders? I think How many what, ethnicities? What are, How many races? <laughs> well, let Aisha answer. I think what, what people are trying to do with this, and certainly as somebody who you know, has looked to do, sort, to sort of do this myself, I think you set yourself ambitions for, for what you would like to see, and then you try and remove as many of the, the structural barriers and mm. obstacles. So you try and create that you know, fair crack of the whip mm -hmm. and that equality of opportunity to see where you get to with the outcomes. That, that's now, fine. We are in very early stages. It's only 100 years since you know, women got the vote mm. in this country. You know, we have had a long-established patriarchal society and set up for, for a long time in the world in this country. So I think we have a long way to go to see where it plays out. There is no country in the world where you know, we really do have gender equality um, properly yet in terms of dis real decision making and, and real Some of the power. Scandinavian countries maybe? But I, th they're still not quite there and I think All you've right. spoken a lot about this. The Scandina there's still a way to go in Scandinavia. Things are not perfect well, in I Scandinavia haven't, I haven't at all. Well I spoken about that specifically. I've spoken about you spoke the... about the right stuff yesterday. I, you talked about the Scandinavian. Well I've spoken about the fact that, you see, one of the things that's happened in the analysis of the differences between men and women is that the social constructionist claim is that mm. the differences are socially constructed, mm. right? Is that it's a consequence of environment that men and women differ. But what the scientific literature indicates is that as cultures become more egalitarian, like they have in Scandinavia, the differences between men and women actually increase rather than decreasing, which is a direct repost to the social constructionist view. So they just deny all that. The biggest differences in the world 
in interest and temperament are between Scandinavian men and women. It's exactly the opposite of what everyone predicted. Can I just pick up on one thing you said a little earlier in the interview, yeah. which you said it's the moral guidance that you are, are, are focused on, you think that yeah. is particularly important. How do you square that with the behavior of perhaps arguably, you know, a prominent alpha male president of the United States, Donald Trump? Um, when his behavior, I mean, he is accused of having an affair with a porn star when his wife was pregnant. How does that fit with morally reclaiming? Um, well, you know, I would the... say that was rather clearly immoral. Right. Yeah, but you not, would still... not to be a target for emulation. But you still would have voted for him over well, Hillary to be Clinton fair, was, as, to be as fair, an identity though, politics. The, I mean, it's just how, well, how do you... was on the table, and I said I might have voted for him on a whim. That's but all. you also just say you started so. out feeling quite close to Hillary Clinton. Can I just come yeah. on, on the... Very the, quickly, because we've got to move on. In a way, I don't, really, I don't care what Trump does in terms of his private life, but sure. what I don't have is him stopping or potentially stopping other women having agency over their reproductive rights and lots of men taking those decisions, It's for all example. about where the moral outrage lies and what's yeah. more morally outrageous um, in, in people's eyes. Is it his behaviour or the identity politics for you on the... Anyway, we'll have to discuss this another time.